welcome back to Cherry Picking, everybody, and it's episode 48. Um, we are at the end of the season. Um, one game left to go against Chelsea, of course. We have got the man himself, the one, the only, Manny. Um, and you never know, with one game to go, Arsenal are in it. Fingers crossed for you, mate. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I think I speak for a lot of Arsenal fans, uh, both Arteta inners and Arteta outers, when I say that we are really um, grateful to you for your goodwill. But uh, I'll tell you what, the fact that a large number of Arsenal fans saw it fit to, you know, declare their support for Tottenham after having you know, given them all sorts of disgraceful abuse following the North London derby. I thought it was rather shameful, really. And um, at the risk of, um, you know, um, undermining you, and I really don't want to, you know that um, the respect that I have for you is um, nothing but genuine. Yeah. The fact that the people at AFTV, including the likes of Turkish and Mr. Lyle, saw it fit to stage a watch-along, a passionate watch-along, I might add, for the uh, Spurs City game, I thought it was poor form, really. And uh, the fact that, uh, let's just say, if you were in a situation where, you know, you needed to win to, um, I mean, you needed you, you needed to make sure that a result went in your favour to qualify for Europe, and yeah. Southampton could have been your kingmakers, I'm not too sure you would necessarily have done the Southampton shirt and started singing When the Saints Go Marching In, now would you? No. No, no, I bloody wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that pretty much summed up the behaviour of those fans to a T. And if you take a look on Twitter, the sour grapes is really horrible to see. Those people need um, antacids and uh, a whole lot more. And as for um, the midweek game itself, I think City proved why they are mentality monsters. Um, it wasn't a perfect game, but um, sometimes... You know, you have to tough some results out because Spurs were determined to put in, put in a good performance. And contrary to what a lot of people thought, they didn't roll over and die for City. They wanted to keep the Champions League battle going, but then yeah. it just um, had to be, you know, uh, that man himself, Erling Haaland. Of course, with yes. Edison Moraes out for the final two games of the season, it could potentially be um, a stumbling block. The problem is Stefan Ortega has proven why he's the best backup goalkeeper in the league. Now, I'm not going to go all out and support West Ham in the same way that I'm not going to, uh, uh, that I wasn't going to even consider supporting Spurs. But I will say to our credit, there has been a slight improvement in that we haven't lost the league before the end of the season. We certainly haven't yeah. bottled a huge lead. At the end of the day, though, it's just a, at the end of the day, though, is just a distinction without a difference. But uh, we go again, whatever happens. I don't, you say there about Arsenal fans and, you know, hoping that... Because I thought Spurs were the ones that were most likely... And I, I've got to be honest, I think City, you know, are on a roll. They're in very, very good form. It will have to take a big surprise for you know let's be honest i think everybody will forgive me for saying that but stranger things have happened but i can't i can't blame i can't blame the arsenal fans for you know watching that game and hoping that spurs you know are the king makers the one thing i did and this is bizarre this is really really bizarre was that spurs fans Supporting Man City in the Spurs' end behind Postacoglu, and that's that for me. You know, if you are watching your side and you've got a remote chance, you know, it might have been slender, but you've got a chance of still getting into Europe, you back your side, you know, for the three points. You don't go thinking, well, because our rivals, you know, could win win the league you know we're going to support man city you know I, it, it beggars belief well 
as you can see, the fog is still on my screen. Hopefully it'll clear up. But, um, yeah. you know, I've been speaking to Spurs fans and Arsenal fans about this. And I remember being on a Spurs channel, not just any Spurs channel. Prior to that watch along, he actually um, had a stream with another um, friend of his, an English bloke who lives in Canada. Mm -hmm. name of Brian, I think. And they were talking about how, yes, the dilemma is real. But yeah. when you consider the history of the uh, huge rivalry between uh, Tottenham and Arsenal, mm -hmm. it's just a sad fact of life, Craig, that the bigger the city in which those teams are based, in all likelihood, the bigger and perhaps the more, you could say, deadly the rivalry. And, of course, yes. when it comes to deadly rivalries, you also know of the Celtic Rangers rivalries, where yep. back in the day, mind you, things were a lot worse. You had disgusting sectarian chants from the Rangers and fans, and even the Celtic fans would also go in hard on them. And, um, you know, it, it was it was literally um, kind of disgusting. And, of course, me being the um, innocent fellow that I was, I never really got into club football as much as I did international football. So... I never really understood those things when I was growing up, and it's only when I got older that I understood it. But when you understand that, if you speak to people who have been born and brought up in Islington, they've made it crystal clear. They make it crystal clear that under no circumstances could you even consider doing that. And I was even on a stream with um, several Arsenal fans. Shout out to Matt Odom, the Southern Gooner. Um, we were talking about that. And TalkSport deserved to be shamed here for... Taking this fella from South, clearly South Indian with his accent, I recognize the accent perfectly because, of mm -hmm. course, I live here. And uh, forcing him, I mean, asking him as sort of like a dare, really. He was wearing an Arsenal shirt already from well back in the day before the JVC logo was um, put on. Yeah. You can imagine how old that was. Yeah. And uh, he asked that fellow to put the new Tottenham shirt above that and actually asked him if uh, he would be willing to support Tottenham for a day. And the poor chap said, I'll be happy to do it because we need Arsenal to win the league. Mm -hmm. So he did that. And that fellow from TalkSport asked him to even kiss the badge on the Spurs shirt. And uh, it was an ugly stunt. And I really felt for the yeah. poor boy because, you know, obviously as an Indian, he'd know about some sporting rivalries, at least with regard to cricket. I mean, if you're a fan of India, you would never put on a Pakistan cricket top. Yeah. Uh, or kiss that badge. And in the same way, when you decide to follow sports or any sporting team from outside your own country, it's your responsibility, in my opinion, to make sure that you really understand the history of that team and really understand the significance of the rivalry, mm -hmm. and then you can do that. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect, mind you, because when I grew up, I remember liking both Spurs and Arsenal, seeing them play. And ironically, in the first season I started watching football, it was 1990-91, Arsenal won the league and Spurs won the FA Cup. And it was mm -hmm. only as I got older that I really started to understand why uh, you could never support both of these teams. It had to be one or the other. And eventually yeah. I ended up, um, because Spurs were going through a lot of financial problems at the time through Alan Sugar, and I ended up, uh, you know, saying that Arsenal were definitely my team. And there was a period in the mid-90s that I couldn't follow English football much, but um, for me it ended up being Arsenal pretty much all the way through. And I was really um, happy to uh, watch them. My brother-in-law happens to be a Tottenham supporter, by the way. And um, we argue over th th more important things than football. But um, back to your question. It's that rivalry which dictates that Spurs could never really want themselves to win if it means seeing their rivals get one up. And yeah. Ange Postacoglu was talking at many, uh, on many occasions earlier in the season about how the team wasn't quite ready for the Champions League. And there's no sense in qualifying for the Champions League if you aren't quite ready to go over there and compete. And maybe he was making a thinly veiled dig at Aston Villa. I don't know. But uh, he obviously joined uh, Spurs after the whole toxicity involving Antonio Conte and how he ended up leaving before the end of the season and how Spurs finished with a bit of a whimper, not even qualifying for the Conference League. So now... 
All Spurs have to do is get a draw against relegated Sheffield United, and they're in the Europa League. They've secured fifth position. So at least from there, they can build something for the future. And I think a lot of Spurs fans also realized, as wonderful a season as they have had and knowing that it could have been better, they may not necessarily be ready for the Champions League. And uh, Postacoglu really now has a responsibility to make sure he strengthens the team, especially in defence and midfield. He also has to make sure that he becomes a little bit more flexible, not to try and um, use the high line too often. They do have an impressive low block. I think Mickey van der Ven is outstanding. But, yeah. uh, you know, that way they can prepare. But had Spurs won, even if, Spurs, mind you, even if Spurs had won, Mm -hmm. against uh, City, there was no guarantee that they would have qualified for the Champions League in any case because they're, um, with Aston Villa's draw, that brilliant draw comeback against Liverpool, it meant that with their goal difference advantage, they could even afford to draw against Crystal Palace and uh, secure fourth spot. And obviously, you know, Crystal Palace have been playing really well under Oliver Glasner of late, Quite credit to them, but... I'm sure that Emery, with a few players coming back to fitness, would have loved to have, um, you know, um, revved his players up for that final day challenge. So I think Spurs decided to cut, the fans decided to cut their losses and say, you know what, there's no guarantee that we'll get into this Champions League. And even if we do, there is no guarantee at all that we will go very far. There is no way that we can count on us doing Arsenal a favour if it means seeing them win the Premier League because um, they continue to lord it over over us and say, you know what, we're just um, they're, they're going to say we're a bunch of losers, and they're not even going to have the courtesy to thank uh, thank us for our favour. So why should we do anything for them? And that's also an indictment in many ways, Craig, of the attitude of Arsenal fans throughout this season, especially after playing a few games. And sometimes I always say your attitude determines your altitude. And if as a supporter your attitude isn't spot on then maybe you need to accept the fact that um, you won't really be worthy of the success that you want. And that's why, as fans, we all have to do better. Yep, completely, completely understand where you're coming from on that front. But one thing that, you know, has come up, especially today when we were recording this, is VAR. Now, I've done a little video about this. Um, and given my opinions, um, also, um, when and you'll see this very shortly, the Chelsea preview, um, when I spoke to Alex from Chelsea Fan TV, he mentions his dislike for VAR. Um, now, I was also listening to TalkSport as well, and Jim White and Simon Jordan were having quite an interesting debate about it. Simon Jordan was saying it's not going anywhere. What Wolves are really complaining about is the standard of the refereeing, not VAR. And I do get that, the implementation. But the problem is, is that, firstly, the figures that are being given is 82% um, of decisions were right before VAR was implemented. That's now gone up to 96%. Now, I do not believe that. I don't know what basis that is on. Um, but... Do you think VAR needs to stay? And if it does stay, what do we need to do? Craig, you've pretty much um, heard me say on record that it's not the technology, it's the application yep. of the technology. Now, like you, I might actually cast some doubts as to whether or not the increase in the, the amount of correct decisions has been that, you know... Um, uh, drastic has it's been that yeah. drastic of an improvement. I think it's fair to say the reason why people often, uh, if that is true, then it's fair to say then it's fair to say that the reason why people might overlook that statistic is because you know how William Shakespeare said that the evil yeah. that men do live after them, but the good is often buried with their bones. In the same way, all wrong decisions that are made will continue to um, live on in the memory of football fans um, for quite some time, whereas the correct ones ju are just, um, you know, completely forgotten. I mean, almost always. There have been several occasions, mind you, where some uh, VAR decisions were rather controversial, but they proved to be the correct call. And yeah. 
I would definitely go so far to say that in the, on those occasions, we have to credit um, both the technology being used and the officials for using it correctly. And I'm not about to, you know, uh, uh, beat around the bush there. I would definitely go so far to say that, uh, you know, even if some of those decisions would have gone against me or whether they go against me or for or in my favor, I would say, you know what, we have to be consistent. We have to accept it and call it as it is. But uh, whenever things have gone wrong, whenever things have gone wrong, that is when we have to criticize the way it's uh, being applied. Because, yeah. you know, there are, uh, there are some occasions where it's all about, you know, how the referees have done their job. I do seem to remember in the in the previous season when we played uh, Brentford at home, mm -hmm. and the lines weren't apparently drawn for a goal that was uh, that should have been disallowed for offside, but which wasn't disallowed. At that time, the lines weren't drawn, and in that case, you blame the officials for their incompetence because you have to make sure it's your responsibility to make sure that everything is done to the letter. Uh, but in that game, of course, Brentford had many chances to, you know, beat us deservedly at home. And, um, you know, they missed them. So, again, we're not really in any position to necessarily crib too much about uh, refereeing decisions and so forth. And as uh, Brian Clough famously said, or uh, it might have been Clough, Cloughy, Lord rest his soul, you've got to play so well that um, refereeing mistakes will not affect the result. Yeah. And... If it is indeed true that the um, correct decisions from VAR have risen to 96%, especially after analysis from the PGMOL, then I think we have to accept that as something, uh, uh, as a positive step forward. But there is always going to be room for improvement. Why only 96%? There's always a difference between 96 and 100%. And so we have to make sure, the referees have to make sure that they start doing their jobs well and they have to make sure they get the offside guidelines correct the handball guidelines correct, and um, so forth. And when you have that technology, you have to use it well, as they do brilliantly in the European leagues. Why is it only in our league that you get this uh, sort of, you get this sort of controversy, you get this um, level of incompetence, and you ha and it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. So I'm actually all for it staying, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Premier League decide to um, let it stay. I mean, many, many clubs, mind you, will end up voting for it to stay in the end because do we really want to go back to a situation without VAR where, you know, poor decisions are being made and there's no way to actually arbitrate them and really confirm whether they're right or wrong? Oh, it's a, it's a diff... I, I, I see where you're coming from, Manny. See, the thing for me is that I think that the 96%, I think, is a load of rubbish. I can't see where they got that figure from. Richard Masters, again, I'm not a fan of the guy, if anybody's realised that by now. But the thing is, is I think, you know, I'd like to see how that figure has been made up. But the other thing as well that we've got to look at is one of the, there's nine things that Wolves have actually said, which is affecting, you know, their affecting the game at the moment and why they want to have this vote and they've been successful in doing it very diplomatically it's not like forest they haven't gone onto twitter and posted and said that the referees are looted in the panel or anything like that they've done everything diplomatically so full credit to wolves for that but one of the things that they do mention is like the fluidity of the game, you know, how the game shouldn't have all these stoppages. I completely agree with that. But fans are asking for decisions to be 100% right if this technology is used. Now, if they they haven't, if they've got a time limit, the amount of correct decisions is going to go down. I don't think a percentage of 82% is that bad. In all honesty, you're always going to get, and I remember, I remember this is one thing that somebody told me years ago, decisions even themselves out over the course of a season. Exactly. Now, it's sod's law sometimes that, you know, the decision right at the end of the season could be the one that could really throw things, you know, 
be it a relegation battle or a promotion battle or something like that. But I personally think that the refereeing standards were a lot, lot better beforehand when the likes of Mark Housey was in the middle, Jeff Winter, Graham Pohl, Uriah Rennie, um, you name them. And we do have, you know, as, as much as some people do think, you know, I think the levels of officiating have gone down, but I think that we do have a number of decent referees, um, you know, not going to say Craig Pawson because I think he's absolutely terrible or the referee against Brentford because I think, you know, he was awful. But the likes of Anthony Taylor has done well in the past um, and probably the best referee so far this season has to be Sam Allison. I think Sam Allison refereed our game very, very well earlier on in the season. Um, and that's why I think we've got some officials to base it on you know those two we need to add to that we need to improve the standard of the refereeing and then you know by all means we could go back to a time when you know pre-VAR um which you know I think it would work but I don't think VAR the project hasn't worked the decisions are taking too long I think you know there is there's Nobody knows what's happening inside the stadium. Um, it is, it's poor. It's poor. And, you know, I could moan and, you know, bang the drum about this all day long. But I think, you know, it would be better for football to go back to, you know, an era beforehand where, you know, we had these great referees. You know, they were all names. Nowadays, I've named two, but I couldn't tell you the rest. And of course, Craig Pawson, I only remember his name because he's absolutely terrible. Well, I mean, I'm not too sure he'd be happy to hear that said about him by his namesake. Um, <laughs> we did have a referee but, uh, commenting on a couple of videos. I wonder if it was him. I wonder if he's got a voodoo doll of me and sticking bins in it. <laughs> uh, mate, 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 there are a lot of other people in this world who might have a voodoo doll, but I'm sure a referee would not be one of them. Believe you me. I mean, we've got to give them some credit, mate. They've got some more integrity than that. Yeah, that and, is very um, true. It's, it's funny <laughs> that you mentioned Anthony Taylor. I can tell you right now that there are several other fans around um, the country who don't necessarily share your opinions on him. In fact, I remember in the 2020 yeah. FA Cup final, uh, Chelsea fans were absolutely seething at some of the decisions um, he made. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, apparently, it involved um, Emmy Martinez. Uh, you know, catching the ball yeah. where he, when his feet were outside the penalty area. And for some reason, I don't think technology was on hand at the time, but video replays will show that when he caught the ball, Martinez, the yeah. ball and his hands were perfectly inside the penalty area. So it was never going to be um, penalized. And I don't think he was going to be sent off at all. I will admit, though, that I had my heart in my mouth because we had Matt Macy on the bench that day with Bernd Leno injured. And... Uh, you know, if Macy had had to come on with um, Arsenal 2-1 up and, and some time left, um, it would have been um, pretty, pretty uh, tense, believe you me. So every single referee, Craig, is going to have his, um, you know, he'll have his um, critics and he'll have his well wishes. And Anthony yeah. Taylor is no different from Craig Pawson. And again, I always say that the purpose of some of technology like VAR is to help referees do their job a little bit better. And it's funny that it's interesting that you talk about the fluidity of the game. Yeah. What the referees and the linesmen are doing, especially with regard to, um, you know, goals that are chalked off for offside, is that they allow the play to continue until a shot is fired at goal. And it could either be um, scored or it could be saved by the keeper or blocked by a defender. Mm. And then the linesman raises his flag saying, sorry, son, you're offside. And then they go and check everything with the VAR. And if it is deemed to be onside, then the goal is awarded. So does it take away um, a little bit of the joy from, you know, celebrating the moment you've scored? In a way, it does. Yeah. But one thing which also um, happens is that a large number of um, players are now becoming a lot more self-aware even if they might have strayed marginally offside, many of them refrain from celebrating because they fear as though um, they might have gone off. 
And if it means having to delay the celebrations a little bit, then so be it. But the most important thing is that, you know, the correct decision has been taken. And there certainly was an issue with the um, Spurs and City game last night when uh, Kevin De Bruyne was adjudged to have been marginally onside when he passed that ball to Erling Haaland to score the opening goal. Mm. And that was uh, perfectly man- um, perfectly dealt with. And in the semifinals of the Champions League, the second leg between Madrid and Bayern Munich at the Bernabeu, uh, Matthias de Ligt thought that he had, against the run of play, scored an equaliser at the death to take it to extra time. But what happened was the uh, linesman raised his flag and the referee blew his whistle prior to de Ligt scoring. And... That was an example of poor work from the officials because you are supposed to let the play continue after the shot is fired. Um, I mean, until after the shot is fired and not um, raise your flag before the shot's um, taken. And replay showed that um, although Antonio Rudiger's arm was over the line, hands don't count when it comes to playing uh, defenders... um, on um, onside or you know catching them offside in the trap, and Delict and another Bayern Munich player were judged to be marginally offside. So it was the correct decision, but just incorrect. Um, it was just poor work from the officials. So as long as you have a situation where the correct decisions are made, and you know that is of course confirmed by um, an arb- um, an arbitration panel, then there really should be no cause for complaints and. You know, it is frustrating at times to see the flow of the play being disrupted in that regard. And I I share that frustration, believe you me. But just as there's a difference between 96 and 100 percent, there's an even bigger difference between 82 percent and 96 percent. And I take your point, Craig, that you have plenty of doubts over whether that uh, figure is um, accurate. And several people have disputed that, including Ian Dark, who had a bit of a... Yes. Obviously, it's, um, you know, occasional Sky Sports commentator Ian Dark, who had a bit of a discussion with his colleague at ESPN, the former um, player Jan Aga Fjortoft, who is perfectly in favor of um, VAR being retained. And I would say that if, if they decide to get rid of VAR for whatever the, the reason may be, then, you know, we have to accept it. But if the referee, it's, it now means that referees are now going to have to be more responsible for the decisions that they make. And if it has to be that way, then so be it. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Of course, we have this final game of the season against Chelsea. Um, To be honest, it's a bigger game for Chelsea than it is ourselves because Chelsea want to retain their space in the Europa Conference League. They could... They could finish fifth, but it would take Sheffield United beating the Spurs. How likely is that? Um, But they could fall to seventh because, of course, Eddie Howe's side could overtake them if we do them the ultimate favour. It's quite difficult. It's difficult to see how this is going to go, but I think... I could imagine that Chelsea are probably going to play full strength, full strength. They've got to go for it because I think Newcastle, you know, will will be all guns blazing, you know, hoping to overthrow them, won't they? And they'll be disappointed because Newcastle shouldn't really be in this position. They, You know, to be fair, um, they should have got something, you know, a bit more against Manchester United. I agree completely. And, um, you know, once again, that particular game at Old Trafford underlined the fact that United's season has been, you know, inconsistent at best and absolutely yeah. forgettable at worst. And I would certainly go so far to say that um, whether it's been the injuries or the Tonali suspension or what have you, mm-hmm. you know, luck has not been on their side. So... Obviously, I'm just going to take a look at the table right now, and I'm grateful to have BBC Sport at my fingertips. And yep. yes, as things stand, um, Newcastle United are very fortunate to have an amazing goal difference compared to Chelsea right now. So Chelsea, having said that, though, Chelsea are in an enviable, enviable position of knowing that if they draw against Bournemouth, they will secure um, sixth spot and Europa League football. Mm-hmm. 
They're certainly not going to get into the Champions League. And so if they, as Chelsea were to try to go all out to beat Bournemouth, it would be to try and um, leapfrog Spurs into fifth. But I really can't see that happening, given that Spurs are playing a, an already relegated and frankly out of sorts yeah. Sheffield United, really. And everything's sort of set up really nicely if you take a look at the table. And of course, mm -hmm. United have... Um, they have a poor goal difference compared to Newcastle and Chelsea. And even when they play their last game, I really can't see them pulling off a big enough win to um, necessarily get into the Europa, um, the, even in the Conference League. And they will be, of course, coming up against Manchester City in the FA Cup final. Yes. Yeah. Can, anyone really, can anyone really pretend that this particular team will be able to upset Pep's boys on the day? It's a repeat oh, of last year's yeah. final. Is a repeat of last year's final. We all know the score. So yeah. I'm sure when you had your um, uh, uh, did your preview with uh, Alex from Chelsea Fan TV, you might have been told about the uh, Chelsea Brighton game yeah. and how Chelsea looked to be in control, but uh, still ended up having a pretty poor ending to the game and had to mm -hmm. sort of, you know, almost fight tooth and nail to. Uh, to, to say every uh, to to um, secure their win, and um, yeah, I'm just taking a look, obviously, right now, and uh, obviously Cole Palmer continuing his magnificent season. He's going to be definitely yeah. uh, a key player, and there's no doubt that he would be, you know, um, uh, a candidate for Player of the Season. I don't think he's not going to get the Golden Boot with Erling Haaland well in front of him yeah. but he's um certainly proved to be an influential um purchase and so we have to give him uh all the credit that he can get we also have to give pochettino all the credit that he can get mm -hmm. even if you might like to give him some yeah even if you might like to criticize him by saying you know he's had an easy run in you still got to win the games you have to win and yeah. you know there is uh only so much you can do on the day. You've got to play the team that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, in fact, it was Reese James who was sent off and Brighton actually scored that consolation goal. And you feel for Reese James because having come back into the side after injury, he was, until his injury, one of the shoe-ins for um, a spot in the England squad as cover for Kyle Walker and Kieran Trippi in that right-back position. Yeah. But with him and Trent Alexander-Arnold having been injured for a long time, it's been the likes of Ezri Konsa and Joe Gomez who've stepped up. And Ben White would have been considered, but um, he obviously um, made it clear that he didn't like Southgate or his coaching staff, so he decided, yeah. I don't want to be considered for the England squad. And as far I, as I'm yeah. concerned, that's his, it's, it's his loss, really. Yeah, so, I can't understand that, to be honest. I really can't understand why anybody would not want to play for their national team. Mate, I, I'm glad you agree because a large number of Arsenal fans have made it clear that they stand with Ben White, but I'm not one of them. And uh, I'm not saying this to sort of go against the grain, but that, yeah. that's just me. So Chelsea will look to obviously field um, a full-strength uh, team. And mm -hmm. uh, some of their players have certainly stepped up in the closing stages of the season. And so I think some... Uh, obviously, Cole Palmer is going to be one to look out for, but... Uh, yeah. Gallagher, the um, uh, captain, is certainly one who can, uh, who's been able to change things a great deal. And he has, of course, been captain this season with uh, Reese James out. And during this run-in, it's amazing to see how they've improved their consistency, they've improved their cohesion, and they're starting to get a little bit better. And yeah. you would think that um, if Pochettino is given one more season, he will be able to encourage them to cook. And Raheem Sterling has also done his bit after joining Palmer from Manchester City. Sadly, he's not going to, uh, you know, um, earn selection for the England squad because I think Southgate has made it clear that he has no role in the team. And uh, But he has certainly played his part. And uh, the uh, goalkeeper, Petrovic, who came in after an injury to Robert Sanchez has also done really well. Special mention to the likes of Noni Madueke. And I want to talk about Jackson and uh, Caicedo 
where you sort of um, segued into that, really. But uh, yeah, I'd like you to tell me what Alex said about these two boys. Yeah, and it's it was interesting. It was interesting. You have to watch the preview, guys, um, to get the full context. But um, Jackson and Casado, to be perfectly honest, Jackson, you know, a lot of people have been saying that we had a lucky escape with him. Um, but Alex was very much like, although he's not Chelsea ready at the moment, you know, he's done decent. You know, he's got quite a lot of goals. Um, whilst Casado has been very, very good. And again, you know, the problem is with Casado is that he's a hundred million pound player. He's a hundred million, a uh, hundred and five million pound player. What yes. do you want and expect for that? The thing is, is that I look at Declan Rice and can say, right, okay, Arsenal got their money's worth. Whereas I don't see the same with Casado, but obviously some Chelsea fans do, and it's it's interesting. Yeah. Um... The thing about players like Caicedo and Mikhailo Mudrak, Arsenal were once upon a time interested in both of those players. Yeah. But um, Chelsea, I think, pretty much proved themselves to be a little bit too trigger happy when it comes to mm. spending the money. And so, obviously, when so much money is spent for you, yes. the more money that's spent, the, more, the greater the expectation, as it were. Mm -hmm. We found that out when we paid uh, about 70 million quid for Nicola Pepe and now over 100 quid for million quid for Declan Rice and now about 70 million quid for Kai Havertz and yeah. uh, Rice has proven so far to be what more or less worth that money although mm -hmm. he still hasn't necessarily been able to really stamp his mark on the bigger games and it's a bit of a disappointment really given that he's an England international and was also the uh, West Ham captain who mm -hmm. lifted the conference league trophy uh, the previous season and as I've said, the more money is spent on the spent on players, the, the greater the expectation. But one thing which I have seen from the likes of Caicedo and Mudrak is that they have certainly a great deal of ability and talent in them. And again, it's all about being able to do it under the right manager. Mudrak yes. obviously suffered last season from the whole turmoil that went on with, you know, the uh, Tuchel um, sacking. I don't think Mudrak mm -hmm. was there for that, though. Maybe he was. And then obviously Potter coming in and proving to be, you know, ill-suited for the job. And then Lampard coming and taking over. At yeah. least now with Pochettino in the team, there is a semblance of stability. And Pochettino is still able to um, work how to best use the talents of his players. And mm -hmm. that is one thing that the Argentinian has in his favor. With Caicedo as well. It's still a question of um, how best um, he can be used, and I think he's also struggling in many has also struggled in many ways to try and get to grips with the league. But you know, you, you give him some more time and space to improve, he will eventually get better, as will the likes of Enzo Fernandez and several others in that team. Yeah. The big problem, Craig, is that Chelsea do still seem to have the look of a team the who's the sum of whose parts mm -hmm. is much greater than their whole, if that makes sense. Yeah. Terrific as individuals, but as a team, they do just don't gel. And they have had some moments where they've really shown um, their capability. Obviously, the magnificent 4-3 win over Manchester United at Stamford Bridge. And, of course, when they went back to Pochettino's former employers and secured that 4-1 um, win against nine-man Tottenham, who... Mm -hmm literally continued to play very bravely despite the numerical disadvantage after seeing Udogi and Romero getting sent off. There have been some moments where Chelsea have um, shown that they're not too bad a team. And so the theme with Pochettino and um, Postacoglu, maybe Postacoglu more to an extent, although Pochettino has done well, but he has been very inconsistent. At one, uh, assistant. At one point, Chelsea were 12th and not really doing too well. But They've recovered magnificently, and uh, they're in a position of strength, and they can certainly build on that. And if Spurs and Chelsea confirm their spots in Europe, then that will really be good. And now, as, for, as far as Jackson is concerned, he has scored some goals this season, most notably that hat-trick at the Tottenham Stadium and yeah. several others. 
The biggest issue that a lot of people have with him is that some of the misses that he's had this season have been absolutely dire. And mm -hmm. I get the feeling that um, he puts too much pressure on himself and has a bit of an inferiority complex or maybe a lack of confidence. He wants to try to impress every single time and sometimes when you have that, have a, a price tag on you, be it Caicedo or Mudrak or even to some extent Jackson, although Jackson isn't as, as expensive as, the, as either of those two, you know, you do put more pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. You do start to overthink things. And, you know, sometimes it goes completely haywire. So what Pochettino will need to do, and I'm sure he'll be able to do that, is to convince uh, Jackson You've got the talent. You've got the ability. Just stay focused and don't allow anything to enter your mind and muck it up. Just clear your mind and do well. And the best strikers will all tell you that whenever they go out to play with a clear mind and raise a sharp focus, that is when they know that they're going to have a, have a good day. It's especially like me when I go to the gym. If I know that I am um, focused on my workout and nothing else, I know I'm going to be okay. But if something enters my mind and I start ruminating on that, I'm asking for trouble. So I think Jackson, Caicedo, and Mudrak will continue to get better under Pochettino. Yeah. And they will obviously be, get, be um, saying goodbye to several players, including Thiago Silva, who will be returning to Brazil mm -hmm. to play for Fluminense. And um, there are quite a few others, of course, who will have to be sent away in order to trim the wage bill and reduce the squad size. So once they do that and also try to make sure they fall in line with the PSR guidelines, because obviously they spent a great deal of money, as you know, as we all know, yeah. I think they're, they're going to start to be okay and they're going to start to challenge again. And it's going to be really exciting next season, Craig, because mm -hmm. a lot of these teams, including Aston Villa, are going to really look to strengthen next season. And we did talk about how Villa were going to be affected by PSR, but I do believe the Champions League revenue and potential yes. selling of uh, several players will certainly help them to um, balance their books in some part. And they can also spend a bit more on a few players. And they've dealt with many injuries, especially um, you know in the run-in to the end of the season. And once they have a fully fit squad, including Tyrone Mings, the ex-Cherry, and Emmy yep. Buendia they can look good again. So these are, these are really exciting times at the top of the table. And I think um, a lot of these teams are going to be very, very competitive next season. So it will be interesting to see if um, the Manchester Cities, the Arsenals and the Liverpools are going to continue to have it all too easy. Well, I think that leads me on to the last bit before we wrap up today. So, of course, a nice. bit of a meaningless game for a bit of a meaningless game for Bournemouth. We could go um, into the top half. Great. We don't want to fall down any places. However, with one eye on next season, if Iriola can put the right players in place and how much is he going to have to spend? Who knows? Europe is definitely a possibility, isn't it? And, you know, I think we have to pinch ourselves to think that we could get into Europe considering minus 17 all those years ago. Yep. And uh, first of all, congratulations to Andoni for um, extending his deal. And I'm really happy for all you guys. And, you know, the most important thing, obviously, again, is the adage that you've got to sell before you can buy. Yes. And some players obviously will have to you know, um, bid adieu, including, tragically, I'm sure, um, Lloyd Kelly. We've yeah. spoken about him at length on yes. many a cherry-picking episode. And it'll, it will also remain to be seen whether other players will have a future at the club or whether or not they will be coveted mm -hmm. by other clubs. I'm sure Mr. Solanke will have uh, plenty of suitors. He will do, yeah. I, you know, one player that I would love to see stay, but I've now got a doubt over is David Brooks. And it would be a real shame considering all he's been through if Brooksy was to leave the club. Um, but 
I wonder if it's best for his career to make he maybe take a step backwards to move forwards again. It might be what needs to happen. Um, and yeah, there's going to be some difficult decisions. I think that is going to be made this this summer. Um, Lloyd Kelly, Phil Bill, um, I think Brooks, I think Joe Rothwell. Who else? Uh, there's probably probably others as well that Hamid Traore um, hasn't really featured, but you know has been linked with Palace today, from what I've seen. So there's a lot of players that you know have been mentioned, and it'll be a real shame. Brooks would be the one that hurts for me the most out of anybody, though. I think it will certainly, and obviously when he made his uh, recovery from cancer and returned to the field. Um, I'm sure there wouldn't have been a dry eye mm -hmm. at Dean Court when that happened. But um, the tragic fact is that there is um, no room for sentimentality in modern football. And it will, I don't, I don't know if um, Andoni considers um, David to be a genuine part of his plans going forward. If he did, then, you know, it would be a different story. And I certainly would not want to be. Um, you know, in a situation where, I mean, as a fa if I were a fan of Bournemouth, I wouldn't want to be in a situation where we would potentially have to say goodbye to a fan favourite. But one thing which I can yeah. say, Craig, is that a large number of fans these days have become a lot stronger and they realise, you know, that there is no room for sentimentality in football. Yeah. If you want to make an omelette, you've got to break an egg. And if that means saying goodbye to, you know, a few fan favourites, one or two, then so be it. And that's the way it is at several other clubs. So it will be sad to lose Brooksy, but there is always an option for him to um, possibly come back to Bournemouth in some capacity. Or maybe, you know, if things do go well, um, we'll see how, how where his career takes him. He is still a Welsh international, mind you. So it's not as if yes. he's not going to have any... Um, he's not going to... So it's not like he's not going to have any good suitors coming in for him. He will get some good offers, don't get me wrong. Maybe he just needs a change of um, environment to get him, you know, back to his best. I sadly don't necessarily know if there's any premiership club that might go for him. Although, as I say that, Ipswich have been making several moves to sign some players. Yes. But... Uh, you know, at the end, at the at the end of the day, it is about what's best for Bournemouth, and also in some ways about, in many ways, really about what's best for um, David, and mm -hmm. if he is able to find a sense of uh, contentment at another club, then all we can do is say thank you for the memories. Once a cherry, forever a cherry, and yep. uh, you know, just uh, just move on. So that's going to be one of many tough decisions to be taken. And um, another tough decision is that um, Iriola is now going to have to sit down with uh, both Mark Travers and Marara Neto and lay it on the line as to who will be the number one next season and what yep. Iriola will be expecting from Neto. Because credit to Neto, he has been a fantastic professional. And it has yes, been, has. it's been a real, it's, it's a sort of a mark of how respected he was and, how, and the level of respect he earned since joining um, the cherries that Gary O'Neill had little to no hesitation in making him captain. But when you, there was a part of me that's, that thought that when Mark returned to the team and mm -hmm. started playing a lot better, yes, he has conceded quite a few goals and Bournemouth have had some defeats, but he hasn't really been to blame. And there was a part of me that felt, you know what, this could be um, the end for Marara and I think he will. He, um, his contract should be getting over at the end of next season, and he yeah. has been a fantastic professional. And it certainly wouldn't really be fair to um, the gentleman to expect him to be willing to either accept um, a cut price, um, you know, sale. Because I don't think he. I don't know how much he cost when you lot um, bought him. Maybe you can refresh yeah, my memory. Yeah, freebie. Oh, right. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm pretty certain the club would not really want to, you know, do what Spurs did to the uh, soon-to-be um, ex-Celtic and England goalkeeper Joe Hart by having gotten him on a free, uh, selling him for 
you know, some sum just so that they could recoup a little bit of dosh. That wouldn't be a fair way to um, treat him. Mm -hmm. Of course, since then, we all know that um, Joey has had the last laugh while Santo got sacked by Spurs mm -hmm. that season. So I would go so far to say that Neto will be encouraged to stay and, uh, you know, maybe play a role in continuing to compete with Mark while also playing some occasional games in the, uh, the cup competitions. I don't know if any other goalkeepers could necessarily be on Iriola's radar. So this could be Neto's last season. He may be expected yeah. to play more of a transitional role before, you know, being told that his services are no longer needed, but they will always be appreciated and he'll always have a home at um, Dean Court. And there'll be several other players, um, you know, with contracts soon to expire who will have to be spoken to. My only hope, Craig, is that everything is going to be done systematically because mm -hmm. you did brilliantly by buying Justin Cloyvert. And I know that... Um, once you do your end of season review, he will yes. be one of your big candidates for player of the season. But oh, yeah, again, but again, do not make the mistake that Nottingham Forest made and try mm -hmm. to get um, really established um, internationals to sign for them. And I'll tell you what, if I were Gonzalo Montiel and Ibrahim Sangare, I'd be regretting my decision to leave my Champions League um, clubs to be a part of a relegation struggle with Nottingham Forest. So you're going to have to buy um, sensibly if you need to, but sell before you can buy. And some decisions will have to be made. But if you can get that right, then, you know, you can start to build. And building slowly is always going to be the way for clubs like Bournemouth and even Aston Villa. And there are some fans who, you know, thrilled as they are that they've qualified for the Champions mm -hmm. League, might consider that it's come a season too early. But, you know, again, they're not going to look a gift horse in its mouth. And you also shouldn't be, you know, um, aiming for too much way too soon, if that makes any sense. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you again, Manny. No doubt we will speak next week. Um, no doubt we'll have to have a little look at our predictions that we made at the start of the season. You remember those? Um, vaguely, and I only hope that either you or Mr. Harrison will have noted them down, because I'll tell you what, yes. making a prediction is one thing, but, you know, once you get so engrossed with the season, you tend to forget um, every single prediction that you've made, un unless, you know, it's a prediction that, um, mm -hmm. you know, in which you've really invested yourself. So, yeah, I'm going to look at those predictions, and um, hopefully we, we will re revisit them, of course, and it will be interesting to see how far we've um, gone there. And obviously, uh, the big prediction that you and Mr. Harrison had about Arsenal winning the league, believe me, that will be revisited at season's end. <laughs> yes. Well, you never know. It might be right. It might be right, Manny. Yes. Um, yeah, I never know. Right, I never right. know. And, and that's, why, that's why all I can do is keep my fingers crossed. But as I said, you know, I told you at the top of the show, I speak for myself and almost... A large number of Arsenal fans when I say that we appreciate your goodwill but um, mm -hmm. it all depends on what happens on a Sunday and um, we'll find yes. out the answers to all of those questions on that day most definitely mate most definitely you never know you might be a league champion next time we speak to you on a cherry picking but Manny pleasure as always and let's always, see mate. you next week absolutely and uh, of course for potentially the final time this season up the cherries. Thanks so much, Manny. Up the cherries. See you in the next one, guys. See ya.